Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church on this Palm Sunday. A welcome to those who are joining us online and will also view this throughout the week. And welcome to those of you that are here, especially to those that are visiting today. I want to draw your attention to a few announcements that you'll find in your bulletin alongside many others. So please take a moment sometime today to look over all of these. But two things that are happening this morning are that the pocket change uh, collection will be happening during the offering. And so this is a time when we have children in our congregation come through with these little pails and you can drop change in and those donations will go to support our mission work in Haiti. And so uh, please give and give generously to that and please watch for the faces of the kids that are coming by. It's a really joyous time and a joyous offering. Right after worship this morning, we will have an Easter egg hunt, and this has been moved because winter will not loosen its grip on us. And so we will be uh, meeting in Memorial Parlor for that Easter egg hunt that is for children and families and anyone else who would like to come and search for some Easter eggs. Lastly, in a couple weeks on Sunday, April 14th, we have been invited by Temple Emmanuel to come to a Seder dinner. And uh, there's more information in the bulletin about this, but this is the first event of our dismantling anti-Semitism team, and it is a great way for us to be in partnership with our Jewish neighbors, to get to know the, uh, the people there at Temple Emmanuel, and also to have the experience of being on a Seder meal. So wonderful outreach that is to our Jewish neighbors, and that is from 2 to 4 p.m. Uh, there's also an RSVP email there, so please make sure that you RSVP if you would like to attend. I invite you now uh, to greet one another with God's peace as we begin worship, and if you happen to be next to someone that you don't know, please introduce yourself this morning. The Gospel of Mark tells us that Jesus' ministry moves steadily south out of Galilee. When the disciples learn that Jesus is leading them to Jerusalem, they become amazed and afraid. Is this what they want? As they get closer and closer to Jerusalem, they fall in with the throngs of pilgrims who are headed there to celebrate Passover. Some pilgrims pick up their pace for the last miles of the journey, their excitement and urgency increasing. But just where others might have sped up, when Jesus reaches the outskirts of Jerusalem, he pauses. What does Jesus want? On the outskirts of Jerusalem, the donkey waited. Not especially brave or filled with understanding, he stood and waited. When horses are turned out into the meadow, they leap with delight. And when doves are released from their cages, they splash into sunlight. But this young donkey, tied to a tree, waited. Then he let himself be led away. Then he let Jesus mount. This innocent animal felt a sacred task. I wonder if the donkey could imagine what was to happen. He had always been small, dark, and obedient. When they entered the holy city, never had the donkey seen such crowds. What do they want? I hope he felt brave. I hope, finally, he loved the man who rode so lightly upon him as he lifted one dusty hoof and stepped, as he had to, forward. Friends, today we imagine gathering as those pilgrims long ago. We imagine greeting a clumsy donkey with Jesus' feet dragging near the ground. As we begin our holy week with a parade, waving our palms and joining with song and praise and joy. What do you want?
as we imagine the gates of Jerusalem opening up in this celebration, let us open our hearts fully to the Lord as well, being honest about the sin that dwells within our lives. Let us confess our sin together in the prayer printed in your bulletin. Dear God, we see you tottering down the streets of Jerusalem on a donkey. Your prayer doesn't look like the power we want. Your wisdom makes no sense to us. Give us clear vision to see you. Amen. Though we are fickle, God is not. God's love is steadfast and patient and persistent. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
thank you for leading us in worship. This morning, as we turn our hearts to God in prayer, we are celebrating with Eileen Slater on the birth of her great-grandchild, Rowan Deborah Slater. So thanks be to God. Let us go to God in prayer. Lord, we love a parade. We love the floats and the bands. We love to wave at those passing by. We remember the joy of candy thrown to a crowd. And what could be better than balloons or ticker tape to celebrate a victory? And yet we know too well that parades can become mobs, that celebrations can be interrupted by terror, that cries of Hosanna can turn into shouts of crucify. So Lord, we need you. Here are prayers for those who wait for the heroes and victors to arrive instead of reaching out their own hands to serve. Here are prayers for those who cannot lift their voice because life or health has worn them down. Here are prayers for those who spoil the joy with their own agenda. Here are prayers for those who feel a burden of expectations that they cannot meet. Here are prayers for those who just need a little peace and quiet. Here are prayers for those who wonder why everyone else has not yet joined the March for Justice. Here are prayers for those who have heard, not yet, wait a little longer. Here are prayers for those who cannot face the cross. And here are prayers for those who desperately need an empty tomb on Easter morning. Lord, here are prayers for us and for the things that we carry as we lift them to you in the silence. Here also are prayers of gratitude and joy in our community for the birth of Rowan and for all the ways that you breathed new life into this world. Give us strength and courage, faith and hope to follow Jesus this holy week as we dine at tables, as we pray, as we walk, and even as we flee. Remind us of your love that never fails. Lord, we need you until that day when we might know the fullness of your joy. As we wait, we pray with the confidence of children of God, as Jesus taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts. Please pray with me. Dear God, there are so many voices that swirl around us, shaping our desires, telling us what we want. Silence all those that whisper and shout in our ears. Help us to grasp your truth, spoken in unlikely and startling ways. Amen. In the book of Numbers, a, na a man named Balaam whips his donkey for disobeying. That story tells of the abuse that my ancient ancestor endured even though he risked his life and everything to protect his master. Only when Balaam threatens to kill does he finally stop and listen to the donkey. And his donkey literally saves his life. 
known as the story of Balaam's talking donkey, it's one within a pattern of donkeys like me who see, hear, and carry a divine message. Besides the snake, we donkeys are the only animal known to speak in scripture. My name is Izzy, and even though they put me out to pasture because I'm no longer able to work, I still have the breath to tell you my story of when I was oh so young. About 40 years ago, a man called Jesus sent for me and rode atop me when he entered Jerusalem. I always wondered if anyone would care to ask me about that day, because it's the day that signaled that the entire world was about to change, and I was there. Now there's a gospel called Mark, that's pieced together the story of Jesus' life, including that moment. First, listen to the way the Gospel of Mark tells that story. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, there you will find a colt that has never been ridden, untie and bring it to me. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this, just say this. The Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and they found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. And as they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus has said and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heavens! And then Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple, and when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now that's Mark's story. I'm the donkey that carried the most influential man to ever walk this earth. And I will tell you what my big ears heard. More than that, because some people consider me so stupid, they rarely hesitate from using raw language to describe the deepest desires. I hear what everyone says around me. I listen to what you want. And then there are some people that intentionally tell me the things that they'd never utter to another human being. They let me carry their fears. They let me hear about their thirst for revenge or share their wildest imaginations. Let me tell you how it all began. Jesus sent two men to untie me. And while walking back to to greet him, they were grumbling about a request to sit on either side of Jesus once he'd come into glory. They couldn't understand what's wrong with that. I heard them say that after all, you know, Jesus began his ministry by calling people to change their hearts and lives because the kingdom of God was coming near, and all that kingdom language persuaded them to follow him. They wanted to know why couldn't they ascend above others and enjoy the places of honor given the risks that they had taken. And they really did not understand any of his predictions about suffering and dying and rising. That just sounded like nonsense to them. The men brought me to Jesus, They laid cloaks on me, and gently he climbed on my back. And when we entered Jerusalem, I saw a carnival of people. That day, there were some in the crowd that clearly came spoiling for a riot. Several years ago, Herod had taken off the head of John the Baptist to squelch a revival. And for so many years, courageous men and women died when politicians attempted to keep the people in their place. 
I noticed that some in the crowd came with daggers and pitchforks at the ready. These peasants simmered with rage, wanting to overthrow the forces of Rome and return Jerusalem to glory. They wanted a warrior to be their Messiah. And even though they didn't say anything, they might as well have shouted their intent. In days of old, parades of people threw down their cloaks to welcome a victor, a warrior victor. And I saw them literally wink, wink at their comrades as if to say, put down your cloaks and let him incite the revolution. Beside, behind that class of warrior people stood those that had such a wearied look on their face and it came from I knew a never-ending toil to pay taxes. They labored day after day to feed Herod's greed. They almost looked as though they were paralyzed with the Roman boot holding it to their neck to the ground. Bloodshed never entered their minds, only the hunger for freedom. These people waved palms, recalling Moses leading the people from bondage into the promised land. Their branches literally begged for freedom. Then there were others in the crowd that knew of Jesus' power to enact miracles, to calm troubled seas, to multiply bread, and to bring the dead back to life. They came looking for a magician or a sorcerer or anyone of any label to heal their brokenness, to ensure that their children would not starve. And maybe there's someone out there to end their bodily pain. I know that they wanted to be seen as human and not some object to humiliate or scorn. You know, I particularly understood that because as a beast of burden, I can relate to that. This whole collection of souls started to shout, Hosanna, and I imagined all those donkeys before me who carried the victors, who carried the people wanting peace from into the war-torn cities, who also before me heard, Hosanna, save us. That portion of the crowd expected Jesus to be the one, to be the one to fulfill the scriptures to suit their desires. And there were a lot of other folks there that had nothing of that in mind. I saw those who cared nothing for faith. They wanted, they wanted to protect their prejudices. They were there to keep the strange estranged, to continue to exile the sick and to push out the weak. They didn't want anything to do with the Savior Jesus. And then there were others who wanted to trade loyalty for privilege. And for the first time, my eyes, my tender, eyes. I saw a desire coming from other people who wanted to torture another, whether an enemy or just make someone into a scapegoat. I witnessed the heart of the savage human evil. That was Sunday. In the days that followed, oh, how the crowd changed so much for ideals of deliverance. Before the week ended, all that pomp and parade faded into humiliation and mockery. And the next Sunday, by that time they'd either forgotten the man that I carried or considered him just one more body in the long line of disappointments. But do you want to know what I felt? He whispered to me that day, he said, just like the prophet Zechariah foretold, he chose me, a young, never-ridden colt of a donkey. And he told me that God made me for this very sacred purpose. Even though I thought I'd rather jump and race when finally untied, his gentleness calmed rather than startled me. And to this day, I can still feel the tingle of his touch. He whispered again and he told me that my presence alone communicated peace because I'm the kind of beast, yes, I'm the kind of beast that a prince would ride to signify peace is coming. And Jesus planned to resist the forces of death with the truth of love. Since that day, I've wanted nothing more than to carry his grace, his strength, his love for all creation, I have carried that every day of my life. 
I remember that later on that week, on Friday, the earth fell dark at midday, and my gentle rider breathed his last while hanging from the cross. And that's when the earth shook and it broke that bloody temple in two. None of the parade goers celebrated. And the writer of Mark's gospel has no idea where Jesus' disciples, who, those men who had untied me, he didn't know where they were hiding. Mark's gospel say that the man they called Messiah died alone. That was then. The path we've traveled since then seems saturated with blood. In the intervening years, the Romans mounted a feeble attempt to silence the crowds that came to believe. They thought they could destroy the temple. They thought if they killed thousands, it might end, and it doesn't. Yes, I've seen a lot of death in the last 40 years, and I've heard stories of hope. I've heard stories of hope spreading throughout the land, changing the lives of all who believe. People are changing their hearts and lives. And recently, those who trust in his resurrection have started to relive his final week. They begin to celebrate what's now known as Palm Sunday. They wave their palms not to deny their fear or not to deny death or underestimate the enemies that seek to kill the good news. And as they wave their palms, they also do so by examining their souls. Do they honor his way of living and loving? And they tell his stories, hoping to never forget his courage, the cost, the pain, and the power of enduring love. You know, from telling these stories year after year and doing this Palm Sunday, we're beginning to understand what it means to be in the kingdom of God. We know that it rises from the hearts and minds of those who seek fierce justice and offer lavish grace. There's a choice to be made, and it's not always easy or obvious. It's not the choice to be on the winning side of one or another. It's never to divide or conquer. It's the choice to join the dream of a world not fully here yet. It's the choice to glimpse the divine in the every day, the every one, and the every place. It's the choice to believe ourselves precious, but no more so than any other creature that God created. It's to be grateful, to be last, and encourage those who have less to go before us. It's to choose the kingdom of God over the empire, and that means choosing the way of the cross, and it's a demanding way. Some call it foolish wisdom. I feel it's deep peace, more than any security or certainty you could strive. I know what it feels like to carry him. That grown man of physical strength, he actually weighed nothing. Carrying his grace felt more like a feather that gave me wings. Imagine a donkey flying. I've carried this memory my entire life, and now you know my story. And it's your turn. It's your turn to tell the story with your life. It's your turn to stand before all the world with the word of truth to bear witness to a life that neither death nor anything else can destroy. But first, you have to want to walk with Jesus.
in so many. What joy. That's what we celebrate today, is what joy. Thank you for doing this. The change that we make comes from us. The change that can happen in this world comes from God stirring in each one of us. And it might feel like something small that we give. But yet when it's collected together, it creates the change that literally changed the lives of so many. We are grateful for the ways in which the Pocket Change Project has continued for decades, ensuring that the children in Haiti, come on, oh, you're gonna take a picture. <laughs> That's great. I wish you could see the smiles from my point of view. Um, ensuring that the lives of the children in Haiti, who it's been so desperate there, know that they are not alone, that there's a ministry and a church across on foreign shores that cares for them deeply and loves them deeply. So thank you for all of the ways in which you've contributed to joy coming into their lives. Please pray with me now. God, you have so richly blessed us with lives of time and talent and treasure. We're grateful that you've blessed us with the gifts that we present now to the mission and ministry of your son's church here in this place and in distant lands. Remind us that every child you've created is precious in your sight, and we can do so much to change their lives, small and big ways. We ask that you bless these gifts and do so in Jesus' name. Amen. bulletin is in it Izzy. Izzy lives. Izzy is a part of the stable of Horses with Hope. Horses with Hope is a nonprofit that provides horse riding and donkey riding experiences for children that would benefit from such grace. In May, Izzy will come back to live again in Gilfillan Farm. So until he is over there, you can whisper in his big fuzzy ears here of what you really want. That's the point of today, to really wonder, what do I really want? What is it that Jesus brings 
What am I willing to set down of a desire that might keep me from getting the gift of life that he's giving me? So my friends, think about Izzy, his gentleness, his simplicity, his willingness to listen to anything you have to say. Palm Sunday took us to a portion of the chapter 11 in the Gospel of Luke. I invite you to come back on Thursday. We'll continue to read in the Gospel of Luke the first Gospel written, and we will hear of Jesus' passion. We will hear of his interactions with his disciples, his interactions with the officers in Rome, his gift of grace, the Last Supper. It will be a simple service on Thursday. I invite you to come back and live with him in those final hours of life. And then you can greet him on Easter morn when the temple is empty. It's a weighty charge to think about what you want, but it's a wonderful privilege. It's a wonderful privilege because as we do so, as we name our deepest wants, we can set aside those things that don't give us life. And we have a grace from Jesus. He gives us a grace to start again. And God gives us the power of the Holy Spirit because we can do so much more than we could ask or imagine. And we are always pursued with a love that never lets us go. Amen, my friends.